No sooner did the consuls for the 87 BC year assume office before Lucius Cornelius Sinner made a public announcement. He would allow no oath, made under duress and coercion, to prevent him from doing his legally elected duties for the people of Rome. Though the historians give us no details on the specifics, Sinner immediately brought legal charges against Sulla, we can assume for his unconstitutional march on Rome. Sulla, however, ignored those charges, gathered his loyal army, and set sail for Athens. The co-consul, Nius Octavius, took his oath more seriously. Unfortunately, the absence of Sulla left Octavius in the unenviable position of de facto leader of the Optimates' defence of Sulla's interests in Rome. Thus, the 87 BC year became a year of political gridlock between the conservative and liberal consuls, which trickled down and solidified the identity politics which now defined both sides of the Senate. Cinna wasted no time. Taking up the cause of the Marian exiles who had managed to escape Rome when Sulla invaded, Cinna worked toward the legal recall of Gaius Marius and his son, by attempting to repeal the Senate's decree naming them enemies of the state. Additionally, Cinna continued Marius's previous attempt to flood the election blocks with all of Rome's new Italian Roman citizens. Nius Octavius, who was an eloquent and passionate speaker, vehemently opposed the flooding of the voting blocks. He argued that such an action would inevitably end any form of conservative government by turning the republic into a popularity contest, which would ultimately result in a continual stream of charismatic actors competing for the people's love and affection. With his superb public speaking skills, Octavius successfully fought the reforms proposed by Cinna. He did this, not out of love for Sulla, whom he criticised for what appeared nothing more than a personal vendetta against Marius over who had been victor of the Numidian War, but because he saw the Marians' manipulation of the people as a threat to Rome's entire political system. Despite Cinna's every effort to reverse the Senate's decree regarding Gaius Marius, he was successfully blocked. Octavius, and the conservative faction, which Sulla had left much stronger than the populists, outnumbered Cinna's popularis in most debates and votes. Ultimately, to counter the wall of conservative resistance, Lucius Cornelius Cinna purchased the services of a tribune of the plebs. In true Marian form, Cinna's new ally took his proposed legislation directly to the people. As his uncle, Marcus Octavius, had once done by challenging the legislation of Tiberius Gracchus, Nius Octavius now repeated the process by using conservative tribunes of the plebs to veto any attempts to present bills to the people. The moment Cinna's bill was vetoed, Cinna and his supporters resorted to violence in order to intimidate the conservative tribunes into withdrawing their vetoes. When this action failed, a full scale riot broke out in the Forum Romanum. Octavius armed his conservative supporters with clubs and cudgels in order to fight off Cinna and his Marians. Though they failed to take down Cinna, who escaped the chaos, many of the newly enfranchised Italians were murdered on the order of Octavius, who used his office to justify the deaths. Octavius next moved the Senate to formally strip Lucius Cornelius Cinna of, not only his consulship, but his Roman citizenship as well. To replace the exiled Cinna in the consulship, Octavius arranged for the election of Lucius Cornelius Merula, who was the current Flamen Dialis or high priest to Jupiter. Having escaped the violent city, Cinna fled to the town of Nola, where a detachment of Rome's army was still stationed. From there, he sent urgent messages to other die-hard Marians to quickly come to his aid. Quintus Sertorius, the man who had lived for two years among the wandering German tribes, answered the call. He was a bona fide Marian, and quickly marched his legions to join with Cinna. With both armies combined, Cinna and Sertorius began levying additional troops from the Italian countryside. Once their army was large enough, Cinna and Sertorius followed Sulla's precedent by pointing their armies towards Rome. Upon receiving the news that Rome was, for a second time, to be invaded, Octavius sent out desperate appeals to various pro-magistrates in the area. He commanded him to march their armies to the Senate's aid. Nius Pompeius Strabo who, following his success in the social war, had settled his soldiers on the land surrounding his estates in Picenum, was able to mobilize his army the fastest. 
he quickly marched for Rome, and camped his legions outside the Colline Gate. When Cinna and Sertorius arrived, their armies laid siege to the city. Soon, Rome was cut off. Strabo made every effort to bring both Cinna and Octavius to the negotiating table, however, Cinna's forces moved to attack the Janiculum Hill. The combined armies of Strabo and Octavius successfully repulsed the attack, but took very heavy losses. Though the victory of the Battle of Janiculum Hill went to the Senate, Octavius lost approximately 6,000 men, and Strabo lost about 11,000. Although Cinna and Sertorius were defeated at Janiculum Hill, their siege of Rome still left them well positioned. Eventually, the city began to weaken. Then Cinna received word that Gaius Marius had successfully levied an army from among his Numidian veterans. Calm and collected, Cinna and Sertorius had only to sit down, and patiently await the arrival of Gaius Marius before Rome, and the conservatives, would finally fall. Strabo continued to maintain his army outside the Colline Gate, in case Cinna should attempt another attack. Unfortunately, Strabo had failed to order an appropriately entrenched military camp, which minimized the spreading of disease, through the digging of proper sewage trenches. This failure caused waste to pile up, and get dumped into the Tiber River. Within a matter of weeks, Strabo's men showed signs of illness, which spread through the water, into the city. Before long, plague ran rampant both without and within Rome's walls. Then, Pompeius Strabo died. One source claims he was randomly struck by lightning while walking within his camp. Another source claims he died of the same disease his neglect had inflicted on the rest of the city. Whichever version is the truth, his death, added to the loss of 17,000 men at the Battle of Janiculum Hill, and the lives lost to plague, saw the consul, Nius Octavius demoralized. Having lost heart, Octavius formally combined what remained of the two armies into one official senatorial army, and then he fled the city of Rome altogether.